Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this session. The IMF says Asia will surpass the US and European economies combined within the next two decades. Note, it is expected, it is not guaranteed. It all depends on how Asia secures its growth, how it contains the inevitable risks. The thing as well, Asia's policy mix is important because it sends the right signals to investors. But what we have to also note is that it is an integrated global economy. Asia is susceptible to the changing events, changing fortunes of regions elsewhere. Take, for example, the expected Fed rate hike. Many here expect some Asian economies to be sent into a tailspin, never mind that the region is more resilient. There are serious concerns. So the question really is, what can be done to inject confidence in Asian economies, in Asian markets? And more importantly, what can governments and industry leaders do to stop the fires of sustainable growth? Well, you know what we have? A very distinguished panel of speakers. Please join me in now welcoming Lito Camacho, Credit Suisse Asia PEC Vice Chairman, Pat Sofian Jalil, Indonesia's Coordinating Economic Affairs Minister, Akadi Djokovic, Russian Deputy Prime Minister, Mari Kiviniemi, OECD Deputy Secretary General, and not least of all, John Riadi, Lipo Group Executive Director. Now, when we talk about growth in Asia, we really have to talk about China. When China's growing, there's so much optimism. Now that China is slowing, there seems to be a dent in confidence. China's still growing at 7% growth. To many countries, that's fantastic. The US would love to have that, but we are concerned. You're not, though, John. Are you concerned about us in China? Well, I think I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, I think you rightly point out uh, some of the big challenges and changes that are going on in our world today. And we're going through some challenging times economically. Uh, the countries that provided, the BRIC countries that provided the growth out of the 2008 crisis are now in a much more defensive position, and yet the countries uh, in, 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 in Europe and, and the US have not been able to fully recover from that. So the question is China. I think a lot of people are now very skeptical uh, on China's ability to, trans to transition its economy from an investment export-led economy to a consumption, uh, more domestic-led uh, economy. But I, I think we're not giving China enough credit um, for the government's commitment and the reforms that they're taking. They're taking reforms across the board, uh, reforms in financial deregulation, capital accounts, in land reforms, social reforms, and I think these will have huge implications in boosting internal demand, uh, but also moving them more and more down the road towards a full market economy. And Lito, you're also a China bull, one of the few remaining China bulls. You know what? It's great that China is growing at 7%, but do you believe the figure coming out of China? When you take a look at first quarter numbers, yes, it is 7% growth, but industrial production is down. All the other data, pretty negative. I think, uh, as Linda, I, I join and I would echo what John said. I think the problem with markets, the problem with you know, analysts and so on, is sometimes we lose perspective. You know, every bad news you know, comes a, you know, a, a fall in markets, a fall in confidence. Uh, I think we lose sight of the fundamentals that has allowed China to grow as fast as it has in the last three decades. Uh, trends like the growth in consumption, and certainly the government's doing everything it can to transition the government to a domestic, to a domestic consumption uh, driven economy, you know, with their policies in labor, policies in improving the safety nets uh, that will allow Chinese to be more confident about spending and not saving. Uh, I think we lose sight of the continuing uh, pace of urbanization that's still going to happen in China. Uh, Chinese government's been very successful in the last four years. I think they've, they've created some 50 million urban jobs. And you know, this year they're expected to create another 10 million jobs in urban cities. So urbanization by itself is also become, you know, it's an engine of continuing growth in China. Uh, the third is infrastructure. While you know, for sure there's been a lot of infrastructure building in China, in many parts of China, you know, it's still underbuilt, and infrastructure 
will continue to be a growth driver. Um, prosperity has also created a lot of rich Chinese, you know, the ones who traveled to New York, you know, Europe, and many other cities around the world, you know, Hong Kong, you know, driving consumption for lifestyle products and services, you know, whether it's gaming, it's travel, and so on and so forth. I think these are mega trends that will continue to happen. And when you put that in the context of an improving external sector, you know, with the U.S. economy uh, continuing to show signs of uh, sustainable growth, uh, with oil prices having dropped as low as it has, uh, creating less pressure, inflationary pressure, giving policymakers, including the Chinese Central Bank, to do what they need to do. I mean, China, you know, has, in my mind, has shown competent management of the economy for decades. And it's an economy that has a very deep toolbox as such, and if I may use the analogy of a toolbox. Not only do they have more tools in their box, they're also much more effective in using those tools, and they've shown that. I mean, last night's announcement about the uh, reduction in reserve requirement, I think it's just Chinese central bank showing that they do understand how markets work, how economies work. And oh, if you although having said that, some people are questioning if additional stimulus can still work. Well, we, it, you know, we will see, but it has worked. I mean, you know, let's not forget 2008, you know, when the U.S. Uh, government was introducing TARP, China came up with a similar, you know, $600 billion stimulus program, and it did work. Because when they declared that they were going to have a stimulus program starting tomorrow, they're able to implement it, unlike many other economies around the world. They're so much more effective in using the tools. But, Sofian, do you share the view, Indonesia, Pretty reliant on China, it's a very important market. A slowdown must hurt Indonesia. Yes, of course. You know, Indonesia relies uh, much on China, but also, you know, Indonesian economy is more diversified in terms of export market or something like that, right? But I think, you know, I I, I share the vision of uh, the view of John and Lito that China, you know, we have to have uh, of course of optimism. I do believe that China is very effective government when they have, uh, 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 in the past, it shows that they are able to adopt a good policy, and then not only adopting good policy, but they have the capacity to implement it. They have a very big, deep pocket, and then they can use that resource actually to stimulate the economy. I think you know, the concern of China, not only concern of us, but I think President Xi Jinping even more concerned than us. Therefore, I think you know, I'm quite optimistic with, uh, 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 cautious optimistic about China economy. Therefore, you know that if the economy of China is growing as faster than we, uh, more than 7%, for instance, it will benefit all of us. Mari, your views, there seems to be a lot of optimism. I think I've, I stand corrected, there are more bulls than our bears. What do you see as some risks of a China slowdown on Asia? Actually, when I look at our figures, so we are assessing that this year 6.9% growth and next year 7%. And I'm personally also an optimist. <laughs> but, but actually, when it's, the key question is not what is the actual figure of GDP growth. The key question is, is China able to design and implement structural reforms which will make its growth more sustainable, more, uh, also greener, uh, and more inclusive. So that is a key question. And actually, when it comes to our... And your answer would be? Uh, when, I, when it comes... Yes, I'm, as I said, I'm op optimist. And of course, China has already implemented some structural uh, reforms, but more uh, needs to be done. And when I think about our recommendations, we have always a lot of recommendations to all the Asian <laughs> countries, uh, and I want to deliver our message. So in our recent economic uh, outlook, there were kind of three uh, key areas. Uh, first, uh, um, China should give uh, the market uh, to play um, a bigger role uh, in um, 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 allocation of uh, resources. Uh, the state-owned enterprises are playing a too big role now, also in uh, sectors uh, where they really don't have a role, like uh, restaurants, hotels, con construction. Um, and, um, also, the liberalization of services ma market is uh, essential uh, in China. The second point is uh, that uh, China should put more uh, effort uh, in education and especially vocational educations. 
because there is lack of uh, people who have that uh, kind of skills. There are enough those who have the university degrees, but vo uh, vocational education that is needed. And also uh, go into the path where you can guarantee kind of lifelong uh, learning and retraining and training possibilities for those who are at work. And the third sector uh, or, 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 or point actually was already mentioned uh, here. They should uh, further uh, reform and increase the productivity uh, of the agriculture uh, sector and make sure that your urbanization happens uh, smoothly. Deputy Prime Minister Djokovic, it does seem like Russia now has an Asia pivot. You're increasingly looking towards China. That's been extended to Thailand, Vietnam. What are you hoping to get out of your, your relationship with the region? Is it a marriage of convenience given the sanctions that you're experiencing, uh, which is led by the US? Well, thank you for, for the question, and I'm happy to be here with you today. And, uh, but uh, uh, if I may, uh, uh, can I just add a couple of words about uh, our, feeling about, uh, our feelings about China? Uh, I generally agree with uh, what has been said uh, by my colleagues. Uh, uh, I think it's important to understand that it's uh, uh, not very rational to give uh, any recommendations to China. Uh, they will decide on their, on their own. Uh, you can share. Yeah, yeah. No, you, 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 can, you, can, you can share best experiences. You can share views, uh, and uh, they have uh, their own long-term vision, of course, and they're uh, efficient in the short term. So uh, we all hope that they will uh, do what is needed, and um, uh, they, they know how to do that. The structural transformations are difficult, but. Uh, uh, they, are, they are following this uh, path uh, step by step. And there are three um, uh, as, uh, aspects of this. The short term is the energy prices are low, and China uh, should be a net winner of this uh, uh, low uh, oil and gas price situation, given the um, uh, structure uh, of the Chinese economy. The second is that uh, they're shifting to the higher uh, value-added products, uh, both goods and services. Uh, and this is a kind of structural transformation that is really difficult, but uh, with the wage level going up, uh, uh, it is inevitable, and they will have to uh, do that. And the third thing is that they are going global with capital liberalization that they are conducting step by step as well. Um, uh, Yuan uh, is uh, getting more and more global uh, currency, currency of exchanges and investment. And Chinese, uh, Chinese investments into the world are uh, um, much higher now than before. So uh, those three things uh, uh, will gradually change uh, uh, the Chinese economy. And we, we hope that will make, uh, those changes will make uh, a growth path um, uh, sustainable. Uh, as far as Russia is concerned, um, we look uh, uh, at uh, Asian markets with great interest. And it's not, not just, uh, just interest. Uh, we were participating in the Asian development for a long time, but uh, not actively enough. Uh, as we had uh, Europe as a key market, uh, uh, as a key partner market with uh, huge trade, uh, uh, we, uh, and uh, we were enjoying uh, good external conditions. Uh, but the growth in Asian Pacific region uh, is uh, it is a sufficient reason for us uh, to, uh, to uh, look uh, at the opportunities uh, in, in Asia. And we did that. We did that not uh, yesterday, not the day before yesterday. We did this starting uh, five, seven years ago. And uh, now we enjoy some, uh, some first results. Our trade with China is $100 billion in growing. Uh, with uh, new contracts in gas and oil and some other fields, uh, and nuclear energy in particular, um, we expect that uh, our trade will double in, uh, in the next uh, five to seven years. Uh, uh, so we're talking about big, big numbers already. But China is not the only country uh, that we are working uh, with. Uh, so you mentioned Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Indonesia. Uh, Laos, uh, uh, other countries. Uh, we uh, believe that uh, new opportunities are mostly in those countries and with uh, companies in those countries. Uh, and uh, uh, we were able to understand how to do business with uh, our friends. Uh, we have mutual trust now, uh, so we can move forward on the basis of that. It's always China directly or indirectly. We seem to have a preoccupation with <coughs> it despite the fact that there are other opportunities in the rest of Asia. Shouldn't we be looking more at India, which is poised to surpass China this year, 
for the first time since 1999. That seems to be a preoccupation. Yes, Lita? Thank, thank you very much for saying that. We're sitting in Jakarta, and, you know, the heart of Southeast Asia. And, and sometimes the, uh, the paying too much attention to China takes away attention from other you know, fast-growing sub-regions in, in, in Asia, including Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, Philippines, and many others, and as you mentioned, India. Um, so yes, I, I think the same fundamentals that we've seen in China over the last three decades have been happening in Southeast Asia and will happen in India. I don't want to repeat myself, but the, you know, the growth in consumption, urbanization, um, infrastructure and so on are stories that you will also hear, that you are hearing in Southeast Asia and we will hearing, be hearing a lot more uh, in, in India in the subcontinent. Uh, I think it's also some of the political changes that we've seen also bodes well for the structural reforms that will be necessary so that these sub-regions would be able to enjoy the kind of growth that it has a potential for. You know, I think here in, in Indonesia, you know, we see the leadership change in India. Uh, and many other places where you know, the focus on governance, the focus on structural reforms are, are, are there. And, and I think this bodes well for you know, continuing growth. But why haven't these countries been able to change the perception of investors? Why is it that when we talk about a slowdown in China, people are not taking into account yeah. the growth we're seeing elsewhere? It, there is, it has to meet somewhere, John. Well, well, I think it's not that investors uh, don't count Indonesia and all the other countries. I think the fact of the matter is China is a $10 trillion economy, and China is by far the largest economy in Asia. So I think to, to, the question, to your question and also the issue of our panel, it comes down to the question of institutions. And I think we live in an Asia, we live in a Southeast Asia, and we live in a world where the institutions do not adequately reflect the underlying realities of the world. And therefore, what I think needs to happen is a recalibration of these institutions. I'll give you sort of one example, which is, as China is the largest country in Asia, the largest economy in Asia, and for many countries, it's the biggest training partner. And yet, we do most of our trade and investment in US dollar terms. In a way that I think right now, as you know, over the, since, since the beginning of QE, $300 billion of capital have flowed into Asia, ex Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Now that's going to flow back, and that will affect us. So I think if we begin to change our institutions to better reflect the realities of Asia, I think investors will begin to have more confidence in Asia, which means China, but also Southeast Asia and India, Indonesia, and all the other countries as well. But Sofian Jalil, how is Indonesia trying to build the confidence that, that John is talking about? Yeah, I think that is the, the biggest challenge, the challenge for this new government. You know, uh, Indonesia is, of course, more complicated than a rich natural resources country. But if you see from a broader perspective, Indonesia is a big country with 250 million population and about 60, more than 60 percent, percent of the population under 30 years old. You know, there's very big potential market, and then you know, and rich on natural resources, we are going now to improve the added value. That's why you know, for instance, for the time being, we forbid or we ban the export of raw. By doing so, we expect to bring more investors to come and go and create added value for the country. And for just for your information, right now, because of that policy, more than 30 you know, smelters is being built in Indonesia in alumina, aluminum, in uh, uh, ferro-nickel, stainless steel, something like that, yeah, that, which will use most of our natural resources. And then also we have a substantial manufacturing sector, which even though in the last 10 years, actually, you know, our manufacturing sector contribution in our GDP is receding, you know, from 28% to 24%. But now we have a very serious effort to push that manufacturing sector again, because we believe with the increase of our labor costs in China, you know, there's a very good opportunity for us to capture that opportunity. And then also the service sector is expanding, consumer spending, you are expanding. But, but the issue course, really is about trust and building confidence. That's right, that's right. That's right, you know. But we have lack of uh, infrastructure. You know, because in the past we didn't pay much attention on infrastructure. But this is a very good opportunity also for investors, for those who trust in Indonesia. First of all, you know, we lack of infrastructure. The capacity of our electricity right now is only 35 gigawatt. That is too small, you know, for the size of Indonesian economy. That's why we have a fast track program. We're going to add 35 more gigawatt 
power into our system. By after we creating this 35 giga hour, 35 giga hour, then by 2019 the total power in Indonesia only 90. While this country actually need at least 300 gigawatt in the next 15 to 20 years. So there is a very big opportunity for uh, this country, you know. And then we have also lack, lack, uh, lack of port and airport, and then the, you know, the traffic. You know, if you go from the airport to Jakarta, this is a big challenge for us, and we are addressing of that. You know, uh, the problem is why you didn't address it before. You know, I, I will not uh, answer that question, but <laughs> why we should address this now? Because that is actually the most challenging job for the country, for the government. And the new president of Jokowi, actually, the first day in the office, that is his main focus. How to address the infrastructure, you know, building power, building road, port and airport, and then we create PPP scheme. The first thing, when I came to the office, actually, I saw the regulation on PPP. And PPP in the past, and a lot of people criticized PPP mean plan, post, uh, plan, patient, and postpone, you know? <laughs> we change that, you know? It's become really public-private partnership, you know? We're gonna tender several big projects actually to, to invite investors to, to come in because in order to address the issue. And then also if you go, you know, on the main uh, boulevard, you know, in Jalan Tamrit and Sudirman, a lot of traffic because we are creating MRT, LRT, and all those things. But Sofian, we, we live there for the moment. I wanna tap on the Russian experience because Russia has lost the investors' confidence. It's trying to regain that confidence back, and there seems to be some uh, progress in that. The ruble, which lost almost half of its value, now climbing. Uh, the equity market is one of the best performing in the world today. What do you think Asia can learn about building confidence and trust? Well, first, uh, I would... Uh, um I would say that we should not oversimplify uh, things. Uh, uh, it took China at least 20 years, uh, even probably more, to get to where it is right now. It took uh, even the small country of Singapore uh, 25 years, quarter of a century, uh, to grow into a competitive, uh, successful competitive economy. Um, it takes uh, dozens of years uh, to make the real progress in building institutions and. Uh, uh, developing uh, um, successful uh, economies with high, uh, high living standards. Uh, uh, Indonesia is a 250 million country, uh, several thousand islands, uh, and uh, more than 1,000 nationalities. It's a really, really difficult task. It's a huge task, huge challenge. Russia is uh, the biggest country in the world with, again, more than 100 nationalities, uh, 85 regions uh, they have with the federal uh, structure. It takes, it takes time, and uh, uh, nobody should uh, oversimplify uh, the uh, uh, ways to deal with the situations, not uh, uh, just to put the list of uh, reforms uh, uh, on paper and say, this is what you should do. It's, it's, it's not easy, but uh, the uh, important thing is to have this vision, to have these uh, long-term goals, uh, and to uh, move uh, uh, towards uh, uh, fulfilling uh, your uh, political responsibilities. Uh, we had these experiences in Russia. We had the 90s, uh, when the economy uh, collapsed to 30% uh, relative to 1990 level. Uh, then we had 1998 crisis, uh, we lost the confidence, we had the default on our external obligations. We recovered with 7% uh, uh, growth per annum during a uh, nine-year uh, period. So the economy basically doubled uh, uh, over the first uh, 10 years of, of the century. Uh, then we had a crisis again related to external uh, conditions. Now we have another crisis. Uh, but we're always recovering from that. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, we are fulfilling our promises to people domestically, to investors. Uh, we are transparent, we are open uh, to uh, all our, our partners. And all uh, investors, uh, let's say 99% of investors who invest money in Russia, I mean foreign direct investments, uh, not portfolio ones, they're happy. They're happy working in Russia. Uh, Murray, if you take a look at the strength of the US dollar, it shows the world's still overly reliant on the US economy despite it not fully recovering uh, economically. There is a need for countries to diversify the sources of growth and also their reliance on specific countries for, for growth. 
Yes, that is true, but uh, when I think about the Asian countries and especially the emerging ones, so they all actually face the same kind of uh, problems. And, and the recommendations to them are uh, very, pretty much the same. So they all should uh, um, improve and increase the productivity. And uh, what is needed too is uh, more openness. You should tackle corruption and you should decrease uh, uh, protectionism. And especially here in Southeast Asia, I think what is needed is more integration. And I really hope that uh, Southeast Asia would look at the European example, I mean the good parts of, of it, not the bad ones, yes, so yes. don't try the single currency in the first place. <laughs> uh, but uh, harmonization of legislation and together making this area uh, business friendly and investment friendly uh, uh, area, so that would be uh, kind of one of those uh, issues where ASEAN countries uh, could uh, look at. And also, of course, developing the capital markets is. Uh, one of uh, those uh, issues which is uh, in the forefront uh, of those uh, problems which should be tackled, uh, the nom domestic ones uh, especially. Linda, can I just add a comment on your question about trust and confidence and how Asian economies can regain, if not sustain, the trust and confidence in the economies and in the markets in Asia? And uh, let me just share a private sector point of view here. Um, in, in, many, in most corporations, especially listed corporations, the investor relations office is a very important function. I think, with all due respect, I, and I, I have been in that seat before, having been finance minister for the Philippines, I think many government officials and many politicians are not very comfortable with marketing to the money community, to the investment community. You know, they're, they're, they're very comfortable you know, buying votes from their local citizens, <laughs> but not buying votes from people who vote with their money. Uh, and I think many of the good stories, and we heard it from Pat Sofian, I mean, many of the good things that are happening in, in policy making and implementation. It's not to take away the most important thing, which is have good policies, and have good implementation. But you also have to effectively communicate that to the investment, the investor community, whether it's portfolio investors or foreign direct investors. Uh, you know, I'd like to see more government leaders, you know, finance ministers, you know, presidents, prime ministers, lead trade and investment delegations yeah. so that they can explain their stories directly so that it does not have to be interpreted you yeah. know, by media or by you know, smart young analysts or, and so on and so forth. Yeah. They should tell their story and be very effective in doing that. And sometimes I think many government miss that. They, they have good stories to tell, but they're not very effective in telling them. So shout out, say it all. <laughs> Can I, we, yeah, first of all, you know, uh, thank you, Lito. Uh, you know, uh, I myself, you know, if I'm a minister, I'm not a politician. You know? In Indonesia, politician means you know, difference. Right? So that, <laughs> I'm not a politician. Therefore, you know, what, and, if Jokowi, of course, politician because you know, he runs as president, but the way he makes a decision, like any our corporate board. Before I serve as minister, I serve in many corporate board. You know, I know how the corporation make decision, and the president of Indonesia nowadays actually make decision like any corporate board, you know, a corporate decision. And he used to be a businessman and something like that. So I want to add you a bit about how to gain confidence. You know, to uh, what we are doing. Uh, first of all, you see Indonesia, everybody said Indonesia has a great potential, right? But the problem is great potential is not a matter at all. But the problem is we can realize that potential. That is what we are doing right now. We believe, you know, I told you before, Indonesia, you know, I, I, from my perspective, it's like, you know, if you watch the movie Django Unchanged, you know, like the Django was changed. This country to change with bureaucracy, with you know lack of you know uh, with a lot of you know harder. You know. That is what we are doing right now to unchange the country, to make the country more agile, to reform bureaucracy, to reform policy, to adopt good policy, you know, and also uh, 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 to open the market. For instance, in the last 10 years, in the last five years, we're going to stop negotiation of opening market to Europe, US, you know, Turkey, Russia, uh, Japan, and Korea. Now we start to regain and negotiate again because we believe you know, we have to create access market for Indonesia. So if we have that kind of TA with, all, most, with most of this country, of course, you know, we believe you know, investors will come to Indonesia and use Indonesia as production base, you know, and then can use and can, can, def, can produce something here, not only for domestic market, for also as, uh, as a platform for international market. Mari, I want to talk about what's seen as the currency war. Um, 
RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan, he says that there is a competitive devaluation going on right now, and um, it's beggar thy neighbor policy being adopted. Your thoughts? I don't see any currency war. And I hope really that uh, all the countries, uh, central banks, politicians, uh, business leaders uh, learn from the financial crisis uh, that there is really uh, no room for currency war. And, and as, I, as I said, uh, when I think about how uh, uh, central banks ha have reacted, I think their reactions have been very normal. That is the way they should have been uh, set uh, their rates. Uh, uh, so, um, and I, when I listen to uh, the messages uh, uh, from political leaders of China, so their message is the same. They are not willing uh, to start uh, the war uh, either. And you have to uh, also remember that from this situation, of course, some of the countries, especially those ones uh, in this area, which have a, a current account deficit, are benefiting, like Indonesia is one of, one of those. So there are kind of good stories coming out of this uh, 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 situation too. I'm, I don't, uh, I'm an optimist also in this uh, <laughs> case. But he says that when the elephants fight, the grass gets hurt. And by that he means Asian emerging economies like India. Why would he be concerned if you're not? John, your take? Well, I, I share Mari's view. I, I, I think the currency wars are at this moment at best a risk. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we shouldn't, the, the fact that there has been huge fluctuations in currencies, I think that just reflects economics and different interest rates and capital flowing uh, as, uh, to, to reflect those dynamics. Uh, I think ca countries realize that over the long run, you cannot devalue your currency to growth, to achieve growth. I think over the long run, uh, governments realize that the only way to create growth is through productivity. So in the short term, I think currency adjustments can allow for co uh, countries to regain the competitiveness. But in the long run, I don't think that's, that's a risk. Lito? I, I definitely agree with it. I think current, uh, calling it a currency war uh, define, it's trying to define what it, it's not. I think, as mentioned by Marie and John, it's a reflection of the you know, capital flows. It's a reflection of you know, monetary policies and so on and so forth. It is a consequence. You know, to say it's a war means that people, you know, policymakers are, use, are not only using it, but, but manipulating foreign exchange rates you know, to their benefit. I don't think that's happening. I think for the most part, as mentioned, I think we've seen that the, you know, it's, it's a race to nowhere. It's a race, you know, it's a downhill race if you're using devaluation uh, you know, for competition. I think, I, I think it's, it's the wrong, you know, it's, it's describing it the wrong way. DPM? Well, basically the same thing. Uh, our central bank has stopped uh, inter interventions into the um, exchange rate market uh, almost altogether. Uh, we believe that um, uh, it's not a good time to try to manipulate. Uh, well, we, we had uh, the managed exchange rate regime before, uh, five years ago even. Now we have almost free. Uh, the central bank is uh, almost fully out of the out of the market. So the exchange rate, um, mm, well, we had huge devaluation. Uh, it, uh, the nominal exchange rate doubled uh, over one month. Then we are down uh, mm, approximately 30 percent during the last months. Uh, again, I mean, we revalued uh, a little bit uh, from the level we uh, we went down. Uh, and um, the economy is adjusting. Uh, it's about economic signals to um, economic a uh, agents. Uh, they, uh, they're looking at new opportunities given uh, the nominal competitiveness they got in the short run. Uh, whether they will um, use it, it depends on uh, uh, well, how, how efficient uh, they, uh, they will act, uh, what, what the productivity level will, uh, will be, and uh, uh, management practices, uh, uh, ability to, to attract uh, investments. Uh, those are the things uh, economic uh, competitiveness, economic growth will depend on each particular country. I think more important is what is going on with uh, protectionism, uh, uh, including tariff and non-tariff um, uh, barriers. Uh, and here, uh, I think we should be a little bit careful with, uh, again, simple recommendations. Uh, strategically, yes, we should have uh, uh, much lower barriers and uh, much less protectionism. But we should be um, aware of uh, the, um, 
uh, of uh, effects uh, on uh, uh, domestic SMEs in particular, farmers, uh, companies like that, and we should uh, uh, structure our policies in such a way that there are no big losers in this situation. We should uh, uh, have the gradual approach to, uh, to those measures. Yeah, you just want to add about initial case for instance, you know, in Indonesia, we, we First of all, the idea of using currency as a, uh, as, as, as a weapon, especially to manipulate in order to gain international trade, that is a good policy, not a good policy. And I think eventually, you know, we'll shoot your own foot. In the case of Indonesia, actually, we put this, uh, the independence of central bank who manage monetary in the constitution, you know, to guarantee the independence around uh, the, the central bank, uh, you know, run. Uh, monetary policy independently without government intervention. You know that is first. The second thing is uh, actually the current value of rupiah is not because of policy that derived uh, by by government, but because of the uh, response to international dynamic, especially you know uncertainty of uh, Fed policy. That's why make rupiah weaker, and they, we don't like that. You know I, we believe that the best interest rate, uh, currency rate is to reflect the capacity, the fundamental of the economy. What we have to do actually make the economy more agile, more flexible, you know, more competitive, you know, increase productivity. By doing so, I think you know the Indonesian economy, you know, can compete and can survive in international uh, uh, international market. Well, Sophia touched on Fed policy. Let's take a look at Fed policy. Expectations of a rate hike. Is Asia ready? Because Christine Lagarde of the IMF said that Asia, emerging markets in particular, should get ready for another bout of volatility, Mari? Yes, of course, in this case, I think we all have to be worried. Nobody knows exactly what will, what will happen. Uh, so I think everybody's uh, uh, waiting for a new taper tantrum in one form or in another. Lita? Yes, uh, for sure, the, uh, the behavior of US interest rates as you know, influenced by you know, announcements from the Fed would have a, a big influence on Asian markets. And we saw that last year, you know, when they started signaling the possibility of rate hikes, uh, middle of last year, I think, when Asian markets uh, went through a correction. Uh, but having said that, I think Asian economies have pre been preparing for a long, long time for occasions like this. You know, we saw that in 2008, you know, when there was a complete credit freeze. I mean, there was no credit happening around the world, but the Asian economies continued to perform. There were a couple of economies that were more, you know, under pressure than others, but generally speaking, I think uh, Asian economies responded quite well. I think for one reason, I think because domestic financial markets have grown to an extent where it's beginning to finance more and more the financing needs of those economies. You know, when I look at economies like Malaysia or even the Philippines, when, when we do an IPO, a listing of a private company, uh, not surprisingly, more of the demand is coming from domestic investors, you know, and the price is being influenced or driven by domestic demand, not by international demand. And I think that speaks of the resilience of the financial markets in, in, in many parts of Asia. And I think that to some extent that will help you know, deflect the potential outflow that we will surely see uh, when you know, the US dollar interest rate goes up because there will be better investment values in the US just because you, know, you will have higher interest rates. So I think that should be expected. And yes, that will create a bump you know, in the, some of the Asian stock markets. But I think the region is, is well prepared, and I think the economies will continue to be able to finance themselves. There are views out there that the developed world have rigged the rules of the game in international finance. Can I get you to comment on that, John? Sure. Maybe just a quick point to, to the discussion before about Fed rises. I think uh, rates will rise. Whether it's six months from now, nine, from, nine months from now, nobody will know. But I think what Asia should do is to begin to prepare itself for that new um, environment. And I think we have begun to do that. And I think what people don't realize is that Asia today is different. The emerging markets today is different from what it was in 1996. Uh, we have uh, over four and a half times the amount of reserves that we had in 1996. If you exclude China, the amount of reserves is still two and a half times. To Lito's point, uh, the amount of local issuance is much higher. Uh, the local issuance in Indonesia in 1996 was 59%. Today, I think it's about 18%. Uh, 
Uh, and last but not least, I think the currencies in Indonesia are, 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 or in Asia in general are floating as opposed to the fixed currency exchange rates and the managed ex exchange rates that we had back in 1996. So I think for all these reasons, Asia is in a much better position to be able to manage the, uh, the reversal of monetary, monetary policy in the US. Now to your question about whether the international system is rigged, uh, I, I wouldn't use those terms. Uh, what I would say is that I think the financial institutions, the, the, the global financial institutions today uh, do not adequately reflect the realities of the world that has changed. Now, this week, Indonesia is also hosting the 60th anniversary of the Asia-Africa Conference. Uh, in 1955, Indonesia organized a, a bunch of countries in Asia and Africa uh, to become the non-aligned movement, to not, to not align with the US or Russia, and to give these uh, underdeveloped countries a voice on policies that hitherto was determined by developed countries. But today, Asia and Africa, those same regions, make up for more than 50% of the global economy. Uh, that's how much our world has changed. I'm not so sure the institutions have changed that much with it. So that you know, goes back to, the, to the, one of the first points that I brought up in the discussion, which is institutions must change. If they don't change, I think they lose credibility, they lose trust in, in, in being able to, to lead our world. And I think it's, it's, we're beginning to see a change. We see over the last few months, uh, China's establishment of the ASEAN investment, uh, in Infrastructure Investment Bank. I think things like this, we're beginning to see the signs that, that the institutions are calibrating, are recalibrating to reflect what is really uh, our world today, which I think is, is very welcome. But possibly not fast enough, DPM. <laughs> uh, I fully agree with what uh, was just said. The institutions uh, have to change. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, mm, let's discuss IMF, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the latest meeting of uh, G20 finance ministers in, uh, in DC in declarations that uh, uh, they will welcome US ratification of new agreement on redistribution of quotas and uh, governance. So the, the only obstacle for the reform of the IMF is the US Congress, apparently. Uh, it, it's a strange situation, a strange world where uh, powers have changed, but uh, institutions are not changing because of uh, non-willingness of uh, one of the institutions in one of the really important and big, uh, big countries. Uh, banking legislation in the United States now uh, hurts uh, banks in Europe and Asia all around the world because of uncertainties created by uh, rules of the game set in one country. Uh, and uh, the same uh, is true about many, many, many other things. Uh, so institutions that have been created for uh, e either for other purposes uh, um, 50 years ago or 20 years ago, or to preserve competitiveness of, of one country, uh, actually hurt the global economic environment and global uh, competition. That's, that's not good. And the sooner we'll have um, uh, uh, yuan and other BRICS currencies, other currencies in general uh, on the table, uh, uh, to be uh, competitive against dollar, the less we will uh, be worried about Fed rate uh, fluctuations, uh, whether to higher or to lower uh, lower end. Uh, we, we had some hopes for Euro. Unfortunately, Europe is, no, is not in a good situation right now, and Euro is not the, the strongest uh, currency. But we still hope that we'll have a multi-currency world uh, with more stable uh, condition. Mari, yes. time to reframe global rules to ensure more fairness, a reflection no, I have actually nothing more to comment to this discussion and it seems that we have very much the same views. Uh, the Asian countries really have to be, be prepared and, and also adjust them uh, to the uh, new situation when uh, Fed is going to uh, raise it, its rates and when you are prepared you can better uh, tackle the challenges. Let uh, has the, perhaps one point about this is is the need for further financial integration within the region. I think I, you know, I talked about the development of local capital markets and that, and how that will sustain the financing needs of the domestic economies. But one of the biggest potential of Asia is being able to finance itself as a region. And I think that's the part that hasn't, uh, that's, that hasn't happened yet. I know I, I've heard that Marie spoke at a session yesterday where she's, she may have spoken about the slow phase of integration of the capital markets in the sea. And, and I definitely agree with that. I think we can do a lot more to make sure that you know, excess financial resources in Asia are financing you know, where there are financing needs in the region. 
Uh, I want to touch on political transitions. Uh, we talked about how we've been optimistic with the new governments in Indonesia. Uh, you know, there was a lot of optimism when Abe came to power, when Modi came to power, but it does seem like change has been very slow. Is gradualism good enough? I think it's important to uh, step by step uh, uh, achieve uh, results, and it's always uh, difficult in all the countries to implement, design and implement stru structural reforms, and after that, win the elections. So when you look at the examples from all over the world, I know that also the Asian leaders know uh, that. But uh, if uh, uh, in this uh, part of the world uh, you may want to make sure uh, that the growth is sustainable, so the structural reforms are, are needed, and leadership is needed. And, and uh, when I think about the announcements and programs of uh, recently elected leaders, like here in Indonesia, so, so I think we just have to encourage them uh, to implement uh, the, the reform uh, plan, because the benefits of that are so obvious. It does seem like the private sector goes ahead anyways, right, John? I mean, you don't wait for policy changes to carry on with the business. We can't wait. We can't wait. But I think you know, to your point about political transitions and gradualism, uh, I, I would challenge that. I think if you take a look at what Indonesia has achieved over the last 15, 16 years, it's truly re remarkable. 15 years ago, people thought we would disintegrate. People thought we would balkanize. And today, that's no longer a question. 15 years ago, we were ruled by uh, an administration with, uh, who used the military for political purposes. Today, the military is a professional military. It no longer has permanent seats in the parliament, and it's, it's acted in the best interest of our, of our democracy. You take a look at the challenges of radical Islam, and as Indonesia, as the largest Muslim population country in the world, what we've been able to do to address those concerns. I think all these changes are, I think, if anything, quite transformative. Of course, I think there still remains room for improvement. And I think over the coming decades, Indonesia must continue to work towards a more inclusive society uh, where there's mobility, where there's rule of law, where there's economic certainty. And, and I think we're getting there. And I think that people see that. And if we take a look at the elections in October and the amount of political participation that we saw from all across the country, uh, it's, it's, I think, a uh, uh, great uh, optimism uh, that democracy is alive and kicking and that we're making great progress. DPM, you were nodding. Um, well, well, certainly, the gradualism uh, is the best possible solution. Uh, now, we don't need another mi Middle East uh, in this region. Nobody wants uh, another region of instability in the today's world. I think everyone agrees with that. And uh, any revolutionary changes uh, uh, independent how attractive they might look like uh, are not good for, for the world as a whole and for the region. I, I think the pace of structural reforms has to take into consideration the political structures of the different economies in Asia. I think it would be naive to think of a homogeneous Asia. It's every country has its own political structure, you know, governance structure, and that will dictate the pace of uh, structural reforms. Uh, I think what's, what's important is not to look at the pace, but to look at the end results. Have we reduced the level of poverty? Have we created more jobs? You know, are we much more integrated with the global economy? So I think those are, those are probably more important to look at, not so much the pace, because the pace will depend on, on countries' political structures. Yeah, yeah just a comment about, uh, uh, a bit about this, especially, you know, the most important is whether the commitment or not, you know, from top leaders, from the political leadership. I think in the case of Indonesia, the commitment for good governance, commitment for bad, good policy, commitment of, uh, to, to, to structural reform, especially under Jokowi, is there. You know? But it needs maybe gradual, or I like to say, you know, I believe President Jokowi likes Sprinter. You know? <laughs> he will have enough bread you know, to carry on the objective. If you, you know, I just want to share with you the experience of Jokowi. When he was governor, mayor of Solo, you know, there were so many street vendors on, you know, all over the city. He tried to persuade them to move to one, one, uh, a new place. You know, it took him 40 times meeting, 40 meeting, you know, until he was able to persuade all people to move. And then finally, the city is clean from street vendors. And this kind of patience actually is needed in politics. But you should not lose, you lose your paradigm and your perspective.
You know, I like to say, you know, in the case of Indonesia, for instance, now we are embarking, embarked on uh, a structural reform. This is like an, a war. Maybe we lose one or two better, but we have to win the war. That seems like there is consensus that gradualism is the way to go. Let's open a discussion to the floor. If there are questions for the panelists, please raise your hand, and uh, a microphone, I believe, will come your way. Anyone? This is impossible. <laughs> there must be some questions. <laughs> Just over there, please. There you go. Hi, Sir? You. I'm Simon Tay from Singapore. Um, but the panel as a whole has been very confident about China, about adjustments of the currency. The typical question is, what could go wrong? I mean, even if it's only a probable rather than a, you know, something you think will happen, what is the sort of thing that keeps you, in your business terms, up at night? Lito, do you want to take that question? Sure, especially for my good friend Simon. He's <laughs> one of the most respected opinion leaders uh, in Southeast Asia. No, I think there are, you know, yes, we can be optimistic, but we also have to be mindful of the, uh, you know, the, the tail risks that do exist. I mean, there, you have the external sector. You have Europe to worry about. Europe is a significant trading partner of Asia. If things don't go well in Europe, I think that will certainly affect growth in Asia. I think the growing nationalism, uh, in many parts of Asia could also be a hindrance to further not only integration but economic growth. Uh, I think even the Prime Minister of Singapore has stated uh, as much. And this, in, you know, this growing nationalism, which is more, you know, in, for the most part economic, but it, it is also, I think, a, uh, it's also leading to some of the heightened territorial disputes that we're seeing around the region. And again, I think that's an obstacle to a faster pace of uh, economic integration. Um, so I think there are, you know, there are some risks in the region and we have to be mindful of them. Uh, well, always anything can, can go wrong uh, and everything can go wrong, uh, starting from, yes, uh, nationalist movement like ter terrorist attacks following that uh, or natural disasters uh, or uh, technological uh, catastrophes uh, or irresponsible politicians in some countries. Anything can go wrong. Uh, but uh, this is why uh, we exist. Well, this is why in, uh, integration uh, goes forward. This is why ASEAN, uh, APEC, um, IMF, uh, uh, and other unions exist to, to fight those things together uh, and to uh, go um, through the right, uh, uh, right door and right way. But uh, at any point in time, uh, something can go wrong. That's right. uh, actually, I'm curious, what would be the OECD's position on it? What so, could go wrong? So, um, yeah. I, I just want to continue yeah. from, from that, what you, yes. from, <laughs> from you, what you said. So, these international rules, so they really are needed. Uh, I mean, uh, the more the countries play with the same rules, uh, the better the, the results uh, in the GDP uh, growth and uh, in the economy. So integration and cooperation in the regional and international level is kind of a prerequisite uh, for uh, sound and uh, stable uh, growth and uh, development of, uh, in, in all the countries. Any other questions from the floor? Here, please. Could you just hang on for the microphone? Hello, Emre Timurkan from Turkey. We are seeing a divergence from euros and US dollars as a medium of transaction. Um, Russia and Turkey have uh, bilateral trade in their own currencies, and we're seeing this across the globe. How much of an impact do you see this happening in Asia? Thank you. John, do you want to take that question? Sure. Uh, I think the issue of diversifying um, our, the currencies uh, with which we use to trade, I think is an important question. And it's something that I think we have to work towards. Uh, and this goes to my point earlier, which is uh, in Asia, China is the largest economy. It's a $10 trillion economy. For many countries, it's the largest trading partner. And yet we use the US dollar to, dollar to trade. Uh, why aren't we using more RMB? Obviously, the question there is the RMB needs to be fully convertible. It needs to continue to internationalize, and I think China is taking steps to, to get to that point. Uh, but I think until we get to that point, uh, we'll have to still rely on, on, on the U.S. dollar. But I think, so to, to answer your question, I think the uh, amount of trade conducted in non-U.S. dollar terms is still very small. 
uh, but we are, and I think many countries are taking uh, concrete actions to diversify um, uh, the use of the, the, the different currencies. Do you want to add anything, Nito? No, I think China has said it all. That's the answer. Please. Uh, I'm Vineet Mittal from Velispan Energy in India. Uh, my question is, uh, is, is this a right time to start an Asian currency than having uh, multiple currencies uh, in the neighboring countries to promote uh, trade in the Asian region? I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were to look at the European experience with the euro, I think we would say that in Asia, let's take our time to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it requires more, more integration in so many aspects, whether it's fiscal you know, integration, monetary integration, you know, banking integration, to have a really credible uh, Asian currency. Yes, actually, I already said that don't, uh, at, at the first place, try the common currency in this area. So it really took time also in the European Union, uh, the integration process and the harmonization of legislation, what was needed before uh, the single uh, currency was uh, adopted. And, and though, uh, as you have seen, there were and are still a lot of problems because the countries weren't at the same level uh, when it comes to uh, economy, productivity, and so on. Are there any questions from the floor? Please. Thank you. I'm Ian Grundy from the ADECO Group in Singapore. In instilling confidence, could I ask the panel what they think about the labor challenges that are going on in many of our economies in the region? We've got very low unemployment rates. We've got mismatching skills in many markets. What does the panel think, from a confidence perspective, that we need to be doing in the private sector to get support for uh, employment and labor in the countries in which you operate? Anyone? Let, let me take a crack, just to get the discussion started. But I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges in Asia. You know, it's part of the structural reform. It's liberalizing labor, labor markets, not only labor within country, but also labor markets across countries. Uh, in the region. I mean, let's take an example of Japan. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges for, the new, for this government is the third arrow of, Mr., of Prime Minister Abe. It's a structural reform. How do you get more women into the workforce? Uh, around the region, even here in Southeast Asia, how do we get labor from you know, markets which are, have excess labor to markets which are short of labor? I think this is where a lot of politicking, sovereignty issues get in the way. I think it's, it's frustrating, and I think in the private sector, we'd rather see more porous in a more open labor markets across the region so, so that we can manage our businesses as efficiently and as effectively as we can. We can grow because we have labor available and, and sometimes it's not available in your local community. You know, there's labor, labor in other parts of the region and I think Asian, Asian leaders really have to start thinking about how we can open up the labor markets. Yes, to add, add to that, I do agree uh, with you that there's a lot uh, uh, to do. And when it comes to gender equality, actually, the G20 countries uh, set together a target that they will uh, decrease the gender labor gap by 25% until the year 2025. And that will mean altogether more than, more than 100 million more women in the market. And that is actually needed not only in Japan, but also because of the aging populations in many other countries, uh, true, uh, true. And uh, another point is uh, that what uh, the Asian countries should do is to guarantee uh, retraining and training possibilities, and of course a good basic education and vocational education too. But, but this uh, lifelong learning, and you have to just, uh, this has to come through. And then you just have to be aware of the fact that you have to change your, your job or career many times or at least two, three times uh, in your lifetime. So we have to um, be able to give uh, to employees uh, the skills that they are able to then change their uh, jobs uh, to. John, you wanted to add? Sure. Uh, you know, I think Asia is going through unprecedented uh, amount of change politically, socially, technologically, environmentally, 
and certainly in, you know, economically. And I think all these changes, what it's doing is I think it is putting pressure on our institutions that I think are obsolete and are at our risk of uh, paralysis. So, you know, to, what I think the, at the root of your question, I think, is the ability of, you know, the, of, of businesses and markets to allocate uh, human capital. Uh, and I think the solution to that, I think, is deregulation. Uh, I think we need to deregulate markets to allow for a freer movement of labor. Uh, when people talk about trade, they often talk about the, the free uh, uh, movement of goods and services, but I think arguably the most important is people. And I think on this point of people, I think in the last three to five years, if anything, uh, we have backtracked. Uh, and there's, there's a huge undercurrent of nationalism and protectionism. And I'll, I'll, I'll use an example of Indonesia. There has been some talks about um, uh, requiring foreigners who are applying for work permits to be able to speak Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> so I think you know, things like this is, is very dangerous. Um, and and you know needs to be needs to be avoided. I think precisely in this time of change, we need to allow for more more mobility. Also, I think another factor to think about is technology. As the technology revolution sweeps through Asia, it's going to cause massive dislocation. And I think unless you allow for this deregulation, unless educational institutions retool themselves to be able to train a new workforce, I think we have uh, challenges ahead. I'd like to wrap up the whole conversation with the final thoughts from our panelists. If we can start with Lito. What do you think are the key moves that need to be taken by governments and industry leaders to inject confidence in Asia? Well, as I have mentioned earlier, I, you know, I think one of the things that we're losing in markets is perspective. And I think it's incumbent upon governments to be able to communicate you know, their stories much more effectively and more aggressively. So I would just focus on, on you know, it's, there are many, many things we can do. Uh, my own you know, uh, take would be you know, communicate better, you know, know who your constituencies are. It's not just your voters. You know, there are people who need, you need to, who, whose votes you need because they vote with their money. And I think it's, you, know, you need to find more opportunities to, to tell your story. Sophia? Yeah, before I answer this question, I want to respond a bit to uh, what uh, John said about you know, <laughs> requiring a requirement or the, the, the discussion to require expatriates who want to work in Indonesia to, uh, to understand Bahasa. I could get this just the discourse. And that kind of policy will never, never be implemented, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Can and, we call you uh, on that? <laughs> <laughs> And then actually, you know, there are a lot of uh, anecdotal uh, evidence, you know, anecdotal uh, uh, case that is something strange that happened in the labor market in Indonesia. For instance, last time we went to Japan, and a lot of investors from Japan uh, who invest in Indonesia complained that, you know, those uh, experts who come to Indonesia should have uh, an university degree, you know. Uh, that kind of policy, actually, there's a foolish policy, and then president said, just right now, from now, we're going to abolish that kind of policy. So a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, foolish policy, actually, not well thought, I cannot say. I, I, can, I will not say foolish, but not a well thought policy actually has been around and discussed or you know, become discussed. Uh, regarding the injecting confidence, I do agree with uh, Lito that you know, we have, what we have to do is to go, do a good policy, structural reform, but the most important thing is to communicate. Indonesia is very weak in this sector. You know, compared to India and Indonesia, India is very good in communicating the policy, you know, and while in Indonesia, you know, we did a lot of great job here, but we, like, we communicate less. I think, you know, we have to do this kind of effectively. That's why I met Dr. Rosler this morning, you know, to thank him to organize the World Economic Forum here in Jakarta. Because for some, for some of you that have never been to Jakarta, you'll see Indonesia is not you know, what, you, believe, what you, you thought before. Seeing is believing, you know, hearing is believing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Fiam. Oh, just, to, just to reiterate, uh, having long-term vision, keeping up to promises uh, that we all are making uh, and communicating what we are doing exactly and uh, cooperating internationally uh, on all difficult uh, uh, issues, uh, but also in open way and preserving uh, uh, the rule of law, both domestically and internationally. 
It's really important. So all countries should follow the uh, same rules uh, of the game. Mari? Uh, I think that governments should create uh, investment and business-friendly environments, but also they should be reliable partners uh, to the uh, business sector, but also to citizens. So every government uh, should be able to be as open as possible, as reliable as possible, and as inclusive as possible. And I want to uh, add one more thing uh, to the themes which have discussed, and that is tackling the inequality. I think all the countries uh, should uh, uh, take more efforts uh, in, in uh, getting rid of uh, excessive inequality because it harms growth. John, final thoughts? I think the key to restoring confidence, I think, is a renewed sense of stewardship. Uh, I think in our own ways, we all need to be better stewards of our resources. Governments need to be better stewards of the mandate that has been placed by them of their constituents. Businesses need to be better stewards of the resources that they have. And I think in, 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 uh, in all, all of our parts, if we all do our own small little part, I think we will be able to restore the confidence needed to uh, make uh, this world a better place. John Murray, DPM Djokovic, Sofian Lito, thank you so much for your insights today. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for being here.